Welcome to another edition of Up Close and Personal with Arlington Orthopedic. I'm Charlie Fortney and I'll be your host. I am here again with Dr. Michael Cordes and this week's topic is sports and nutrition. Dr. Cordes was a member of the Governor Council of Physical Fitness and Sports in Pennsylvania. He is the chairman of the Advisory Medical Committee for the Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic Association, a member of the Pennsylvania Athletic Commission, an advisory member of the National Athletic Trainers Association, and the Pennsylvania Athletic Trainer Society, in which he was inducted recently into the Hall of Fame. Dr. Cordes, the topic of sports and nutrition to me has gotten a lot more complicated over the years because, especially the recent years, with all these supplements that kids are taking to get stronger and there's a dehydration factor if you're not, creatine, can you talk about, it's just, it's a lot. I mean, can you, can you digest that for us? Uh, that would be a very long digestive process to get through all of it. But it, uh, there are more and more supplements out in the market. And recently, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine uh, and the American Academy of uh, Sports Medicine come out and basically said, there's no, no real research out there to show us that any of the supplements really work. Mm. Most of the supplements that kids take go into their stomach and they are digested. Mm. If they're not digested, they go into the urine and it sometimes is said that the American male, especially the American athletic male in this country, has the most rich urine in the world because what goes in comes out and it comes out through the urine and most of it just comes out basically the way it went in. Uh, creatine was the biggie that uh, was out there. When I was at Penn State, Joe said to me one time that, that we really need to look at creatine because the Big Ten was using creatine. Mm. So we evaluated the creatine thing, and uh, we actually worked with JT, who is our strength coach at Penn State, and we looked at the kids, evaluated uh, what their uh, recovery time would be after exercise uh, while they were on creatine compared to what they did the year before when they weren't on creatine. Uh, to check and see uh, their powerlifting, how heavy they could lift, how many reps could they do, uh, how explosive was their takeoff. We did all of that, and we found out there was one kid on the team that actually got better using creatine, and he was a vegetarian. Those kids, when they eat, if they eat a good basic diet and eat the right amount of protein, carbohydrate, uh, fruits, uh, all of this stuff, they're going to get enough. They don't need the excess. In fact, we found out that what creatine does, creatine is what we call a hydrophilic kind of compound. Mm. Hydrophilic means it sucks in water. Mm. And what it does is it sucks in water into the muscles. And what happens to the muscles, then the muscles get bigger, but they don't get bigger because they're hypertrophying. In other words, they're getting larger because of, of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the growth of the muscle itself because of exercise. They're getting bigger because they have more water in them. And subsequently, they get heavier. And because subsequently, because they get heavier, they strain. You have a tendency to pull. And especially in football players, hamstrings. Mm. We had a lot of people that got hamstring problems because of creatine, and we stopped using it. Because, I mean, when, once a football player gets a hamstring pull or a basketball player, yeah. they got it all season. Yeah. It, you just don't it's get hard rid to get, of those. Yeah. Exactly. So we have decided that, uh, that really there's none of, the, none of the supplements out there really do a good job. Do athletes... <laughs> need nutritional aids? And if so, which ones seem safer than the others? An athlete that plays a football game, after he's done with the game, can use a power aid, power drink of some type. Uh, that gives them a little bit of a boost. But if they go home and they eat a good solid dinner or they eat a good solid meal and continue to do so, they don't need a whole lot of supplements out there. Some of the power aids that are out there are fairly decent. Gatorade's a, a, a good drink. Mm -hmm. Do we use Gatorade during the game, or should we not use Gatorade during That's very controversial. Individuals that are involved in marathons and long-term uh, type things, uh, exercises, probably need something that is going to give them some salts, potassium, sodium, things like that, along with fluids, along with some carbohydrates. So that would help them. But individuals that are out on a football field or basketball court that are playing for two to three hours, they don't need it. What they need is cold water. The cold water will hydrate them enough, and they don't need the supplements because the supplements stay in their stomach. Anytime you take water and put anything in water, it makes it harder to digest. If you don't digest it, you don't get it into your system. If you don't get it into your system, it's worthless. Well, talk about the importance of replenishing those electrolytes because you know I'm hearing that water can only do so much for you, but these Gatorades are giving you that electrolyte uh, dose that you need. Well, you know... I guess the situation is this, and one of the questions I ask my residents 
what is sweat? When you perspire, how much salt do you have in that? You can either be hypotonic, which means very little, isotonic, which means just a normal amount, or hypertonic, which means you're excessively getting rid of salts because you're perspiring. Actually, there's very little in the way of salts in perspiration. Mm. Very little. Mm. And why does it taste so salty? Well, if you take a gallon of water and you take a pinch of salt and throw it in that gallon of water, it's going to taste salty. But you don't have a whole lot of it in there. So you don't really lose that much salt. When you come home, for example, you're done with a, it's August or September, early football season, and you're out there beating your head and, and everything else, and you're coming off and you're all soaking through it. When you get on a scale, you should be weighed before and you should be weighed after the event. The amount of weight that you've lost is water weight. Right. So how much do you replace one pound of, uh, of, of water, of, of, of uh, weight loss? With 16 ounces of water, 16 <laughs> ounces of one pound. It's, it's a no-brainer, right? That's what you want to do. And that's enough. What do you say to parents like me who have younger kids who want to get stronger, they're into sports, and they start experimenting with drinks or pills or powder to try to build their body up? Is this healthy? Is this, is this something that we should allow our kids to do? First, do no harm, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if you have a situation where they have a given supplement, a, a given uh, drink of some type, that's been on the market, that is reputable, it's perfectly fine. You need to watch what's in these things. Yeah. Because very often you have an anabolic androgenic steroid in these things, at least it's a producer. What is an anabolic androgenic steroid? That's the stuff that we see all over TV and everything. That They finally got baseball into it and they're finally doing what they should have done 20 years ago. Right. Those are the steroids we've got to be very cautious with. And those types of things sometimes you can find in a drink. You need to look at the drink and if you have any questions about what the content is of that drink, Talk to your doctor and see what some of these things do. Some of them are look very innocuous, but they convert into a steroid. And steroids are bad things. I mean, so is it a matter of these approved drinks, these approved um, powder mixes, uh, they, have, they have components of this that, that kind of do the same thing? Are they, are they going under that regulation? or How, how are they making this work? Because steroids are illegal. Yeah, we know so, that. So, so, so what... What, what are these drinks? How are they getting these approved? Well, the problem we have into, we have a Federal Drug Administration, the FDA, that you've probably heard of many, many times, and these are the people that pass all of the regulations concerning our drugs in this country. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, supplements do not fall under the jurisdiction of the FDA. So they're out there all by themselves, and this is why so many of these things can cause problems. Mm -hmm. If the FDA hears of some things, because we had a, a problem not too long ago with, uh, long ago with pseudofedrin, Pseudoephedrine is a drug that we use for years and years and years for congestion. Well, we also know that if you use that in a drink or you use that in a pill form, it is an ergogenic aid. It will assist you in trying to do something that is active. But it doesn't go without problems. The problems being hypertension, it can cause all kinds of significant cardiac problems, and can cause strokes. Mm. So now the government stepped in after the post, post all this problem, they stepped in and they outlawed the pseudoephedrine now. They outlawed ergotamine. They outlawed a whole bunch of things that had been out there for years. But the problem is nobody is looking at those drinks and saying, hey, this has this, this has this, this has this. Mm. It's a supplemental situation and it's considered to be okay, like all the vitamins. What is your biggest concern as a physician for the student athletes uh, in their health and, and their eating habits? My biggest concern is kids today are eating improperly because fast food is so easy to obtain. Mm. And the parents very often bring it home. Right. Now there's nothing wrong with going over and getting a, a burger at Wendy's or something like that. There's nothing wrong with that occasionally. But when you exist on burgers and french fries and milkshakes, you're going to end up with what we have right now in this country, notoriously obesity. Mm. You have too much obesity in kids today. We're, we're at the stage in this country right now where we're cutting back on all of the gym phys ed type courses right. because they're expensive and we're increasing all of the fat in food and schools and what are we going to end up with well, with what we have an obese generation dr quarters you're the uh, chairman of the sports medicine advisory committee for the piaa so you guys are making recommendations to these guys what are some of those key recommendations that, that and what are some of the latest ones you guys have been making well the latest ones is we require individuals that are wrestlers specifically mm -hmm. Uh, who want to get, as you know, wrestling is, is based on a weight. You uh, have to be a certain weight in order to wrestle at that weight. You can't be over or above. You, know, you have to be just about at that weight. 
Well, we just recently, I guess it was probably a year ago, year and a half ago, came out with, uh, with requirements to reach that weight. Mm -hmm. An individual may wrestle at no less than 7% of body fat. So we measure body fat by means of skinfold calipers now, mm -hmm. and we test to see whether the individual's urine is concentrated or not so that they're hydrated properly. Right. So we do all this thing to make wrestling very, very safe. We had a tremendous amount of uh, arguments with the coaches out there to begin with, but guess what? Last year we had very few injuries because of weight loss. Uh, we almost have no bloody noses anymore tournaments. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole different group of wrestlers coming up now that are doing their weight regulations, but doing it as safely as possible. So we're doing that. We're looking at different things in football too. You know, everybody worries about the individual, the a young lady who loses weight very quickly and, and uh, has problems and, and develops weight, what we call the female triad, which is loss of weight and, and disruption of bony art architecture. All kinds of bad things can happen with it. And basically what we're doing with, with these is we're treating these individuals very, very carefully because they lose too much weight and develop anorexia and have significant problems. But what about the individual who's a football player who also has an eating disorder? Right. But now his eating disorder is he eats too much. So he's like 350 pounds and he's trying to run and he's trying to do things with a weight like that. Mm. We note that, for example, the football players, professional football players, their age of death is usually around 54. Wow. And I mean, that's because all these years they've been running, contact, eating improperly, gaining all this weight, and then all of a sudden they stop. And they stop doing all these exercises, but their diet is not any better now. They're eating just as much. So what we're trying to do in PIAA is understand the athlete's sport, understand the athlete that participates in the sport, and give them a good basic diet to continue to participate as safely as possible. Well, Dr. Cordes, thank you because of you. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to start eating right. And, and yeah, I'm telling you the truth. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you.